As we continue in our series, The King and His Kingdom, we are going to see Jesus address one of perhaps the biggest problems in the church today. It was a big problem in Jesus' time, and it was a big problem in our time. You've probably noticed it. The problem is where those who claim to follow Christ behave okay outwardly. Their kind of outward behavior is decent, but their inward behavior, their heart, usually in private, doesn't actually look like Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? It's the person who comes to worship on a Sunday morning, but is a complete jerk to their co-workers. It's the parent who claims to love the Lord, but shows no grace, mercy to their children. It's the pastors you see in the news over and over who claim to love Jesus and claim to teach the Bible, but the scandal breaks that they're cheating on their spouse or they're stealing from the church, and so this doesn't get clipped up. I'm doing none of those things. You can't get me, internet. Um, but we've all seen those things happen, and you wonder, wait a second, how is, how is this person who's supposed to be a man of God teaching God's word doing these things? Because their outward behavior appeared Christian, but their inward heart was not transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Their, their inward self wasn't changed. And we're going to see Jesus kind of start to shift in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as we're in this series in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going to go after our heart every single week. In some ways, it'll become exhausting because it is somewhat easy to manipulate or manicure our outward behavior. It is tiring and challenging to do battle with our heart that wants to do its own thing rather than bow to Jesus as king. What we'll see today, though, is that oftentimes our outward behavior is really just a simple reflection of our inward reality. And it's why Jesus is so fixated on you and I having a heart shaped after him rather than just looking the part. Because even when you and I are faking it on the outside, the facade can only last for so long. We all know it, that eventually what is rooting around in our hearts makes its way to the surface. That's why Jesus is going to take direct aim. So we're going to be in Matthew 5. We're actually going to go from 17 to 20, uh, 28 but I want to start with 17 to 20. So we're going to start with 5, 17 to 20. If you have your Bible, the text will be on the screen too. If you need a Bible, we just re- uh, stack them at our Welcome Center, so you're welcome to grab one there. It says, now I can, cont- uh, excuse me. Do you think that I have come, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will, be, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least of these in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I can tell you, for all you Bible uh, quizzers and all-stars, believe it or not, these four verses here are some of the most hotly debated in the book of Matthew. And I know many of you are like, that doesn't sound like a debate I want to listen to. That's okay. I'm going to cut, hopefully, right to the chase. But there's this a lot of debate of what does Jesus mean when he says he hasn't come to abolish the law but fulfill it? What does Jesus mean but that the, that the idea of righteousness or right living surpasses, that our righteousness must surpass the teachers of the law? I want to offer what I think is the most accurate interpretation of the text. Though several disagree with me, you're welcome to. But this is the way it seems Jesus is teaching. Jesus says that I have not come to abolish or set aside the law and the prophets. Rather, my mission on this earth is to be a fulfillment of these things. That I am the promise of the prophets, and I am the life lived fully in the law. Now, the reason this can feel challenging for Christians is that we know, if we read books like Galatians or something like that, that we are free from the law. But Christ says that you must fulfill the law, and so we wrestle with this text. It says that there is virtue in the law, and it must not be set aside. It appears to me and many scholars that Jesus is saying one thing, obviously, that he has come to fulfill the law completely. That Jesus has come and is going to live a sinless life, and he will follow the law to the T for a bunch of people who have no ability to get it right. 
And in so fulfilling the law and not setting it aside, he lends his righteousness to those who call on him in faith. Jesus is the fulfillment of what the prophets would say to come, the Lion of Judah and the Lion of David, who would be Israel's new king, the Messiah, the Christ. And if you notice from the series title, The King and the Kingdom, Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of the prophets. He is indeed the king. But what we're going to see in the next few minutes is Jews have begun to treat the law in letter, not in spirit. So what do I mean by that? That Jesus is going to begin challenging the Pharisees and the teachers of the day who are fulfilling the letter of the law, but Jesus is very much concerned with the spirit of the law. We're going to see that directly today. He's going to talk about murder. And he's going to take aim at the heart of you and I and his listeners then. And he's going to say, you have to be more righteous. You have to live more rightly than the Pharisees and the teachers who live by the letter of the law. But if you want to be in my kingdom, I need you to live by the spirit of the law. It needs to actually transform your life. Jesus is saying, these people have behaved outwardly right, but I expect you to behave inwardly right. This is kind of the best summation I can put up. When just our behavior is shaped like Jesus, a wicked heart will eventually rebel. When our heart is shaped like Jesus, our behavior will fall in line. Does that make sense? You've all seen this. Some of them are experiencing it in the kindergarten classroom right now, right? <laughs> there's kids' hearts that are regenerated and they're lovely, and there's other kids that know that their dad will beat them in the car, so they're just minding their P's and Q's. One is behaving because they're like, well, I better just do it, and I'm a little afraid, but if they have a bad day, it's going to be a bad day. Others are transformed. This is true for us. When just our behavior is shaped like Jesus, eventually it will crack. The pastors that go off the rails, they, ha they perfected the way of behaving like Jesus, but their heart wasn't transformed like Jesus, so eventually their behavior didn't match what was in their heart. So the challenge isn't just to live, uh, that we would have this challenge with these people who are super righteous and Jesus is saying, you know, hey, they're, they're really holy and you've got to somehow be better than them. He's saying, these people, these Pharisees, they've just lived outwardly right and I expect the word to change your inward, to shape your heart. This is going to be really important for us over the next few months because Jesus is going to be constantly going for our heart because good behavior only gets, so, gets us so far. If our heart is not transformed in the way Jesus wants us to be, wants it to be, eventually we'll throw up our hands and give in. We might maintain the facade of the outward, but on the inward we'll be a mess. And as the scriptures say, eventually everything that is done in the dark will be brought to the light. Remember what I've said a few weeks ago, and we'll come back to it a lot during the series. The kingdom of God begins where you and I end. There is no self in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is going to continue to come after our core, our heart, and say, I want the flesh to be gone. I want my kingdom to rule your heart, and your self needs to end, because the kingdom of God begins where our self ends. It's about fully following Christ in his way. So Jesus begins this section by saying, I'm the fulfillment of the law, I'm the outriggers of the law, and if it is upheld from the inside out, it is far more than just behavior modification. If you want to be in my kingdom, you will need to allow the law to work in your heart. Jesus is not going to start by, and then Jesus is going to start by quoting the law today, back to them. He's going to talk about murder this week. And over the next several weeks, he's going to say this phrase. You're going to hear him over and over say, you have heard it said. And what Jesus is saying, here's the piece of law that you've heard over and over. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. And then he's going to say this phrase, but I tell you, and he's going to go straight for the heart each and every time. Jesus is looking at our heart because when just our behavior is shaped like Jesus, eventually a wicked heart will rebel. When a heart is shaped like Jesus, our behavior will fall in line. 
So let's see what Jesus says about murder, everyone's favorite topic, in 21 through 26. This is Matthew 5, 21 through 26. It says, You have heard it said, it was said by long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with another brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to another brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to them in court. Raka is like calling someone a dolt or like a numbskull. It probably had a lot more color, but that's about as best as I'm willing to go today. So it's like an insult, right? So anyone who says brother or sister Raka is answerable in court. Anyone who says you fool will be in the danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with an adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while they're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison, and truly I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. So let's make sure we understand what Jesus is saying here. Jesus restates the Old Testament law, the sixth commandment of the Big Ten, do not murder, number six. He says, to take a life without cause. So not at war, not defending your family, uh, not as punishment for a crime. Murder is the idea of taking a life without cause or just cause. He says, if you do that, you will be judged. And all of us would say, yeah, okay, we're good with that. We're good with the do not murder thing. But then Jesus says, You've heard it said, do not murder, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with their brother will be subject to judgment. And then Jesus, like any good preacher, makes his point three different ways. I don't think he was actually trying to ramp up the escalation. He says anyone that's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone that cries out raka to his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who cries out you fool to his brother is close to the fires of hell. I don't think he was actually trying to rank and say, like, so if you yell, you fool, that's worse than Raka, and, like, we're trying to get into that. He's trying to say that if you have this rooting around in your heart, you are close to judgment or will be judged. You've heard it said, do not be a murderer, which is outward behavior. No one can literally murder someone without the actions of another person. So you and I... I'm really hoping that we're 100% in this room all good with the, Lord, I have never murdered. Sixth commandment, I'm good with. If you're not, Officer Fueling would like to talk to you after service. It's a good time to make a confession, okay? I think the rest of us are like, Lord, I've never murdered. And he's like, good. But how many of you can say, you're so far removed from murder, have you ever wished someone dead in your heart? Have you ever destroyed someone in your heart and your mind? It's like Jesus saying, I tell you that if you allow your heart to go to a place of rage, to have hatred for another person, those murderous feelings are lurking within. Beware. Notice he says, if you call your other brother a fool, beware, you're in dangers of the fire of hell. It's this idea that if it is lurking in there, it might creep out of there. And you probably are seeing what Jesus is getting at. He's trying to prove his point in three ways. He's saying the same thing over and over. In verses 23 through 26, he says, If you're worshiping God at the altar, but you know that you have something against a brother or sister, go and be reconciled to that brother or sister if you can. Otherwise, you'll face earthly judgment from the courts or the police. He's not again trying to escalate the punishment. He's saying make peace with people. So the counsel from Jesus today is be wary of your heart just because you can say, look, I've never killed anyone, Jesus. The hatred and anger in your soul can drive you to very dark places. And he says, be very, very wary because eventually that facade might crack and every murderer sitting in prison was one person that had a really bad day. They had a lot of hate and anger before that point, but that one day they didn't control their behavior. And then he says, try and live at peace and make peace with your adversaries even before you worship God. 
That's a huge point that Jesus says. He says, if you're literally worshiping God, if you're at the altar making a gift, I want you to leave worship and go and make peace with another person. That's how much Jesus values making peace with your enemies. My goal each and every week is to ensure that you understand the Bible first and foremost. I have not actually tried to apply the text to your life. So far, I'm just trying to help you understand what does the Bible say. That's why we take so much of our time every single week and try and break it down into bite-sized chunks so that now you can come away and be like, okay, I kind of get what Jesus is saying. I try and understand and I'm tracking with what Jesus is after here. But in the time we have left, I want to look at kind of two points to try and drive it home for us and to apply it to our heart. And the first one is this. Your heart will tell on you. That's why Jesus cares so much about it. Your heart will eventually tell on you. It's why Jesus cares so much about your heart. It's why Jesus makes such a point of it. And if you're anything like me, it's easy to think Jesus is going a little heavy here. Jesus, you're telling me that I'm the same or I'm worthy of judgment the same as a murderer if I'm angry? Take it down a notch, Jesus. I didn't actually murder anyone. It's very easy in our flesh to kind of push back on Jesus' line of thinking. But listen to how silly it would be if we verbalized our thoughts out loud to other people. Look, Jesus, I didn't murder anyone. Sure, I did fantasize about running that minivan off the road because it was in the left lane and it wasn't going the speed limit. And I did think about trying to pass the semis on the left because they formed a blockade, and I know they do that on purpose, and it really made me angry. And sure, I was really uh, thinking terrible things about my neighbor when they wouldn't mow their lawn or when their dog came and pooped in my yard. These are literally all examples from my life, by the way. I'm like just running through my last week. They left their dog poop in my yard. Come on. And so do I really get to go to Jesus and say, look, I didn't actually murder them. I'm just here as your servant representing you, hating them for their behavior and thinking wicked things about them. Do you you see the problem that we face there? Our heart will tell on us, and it's why Jesus cares. Jesus is looking back and saying, eventually you will do that. Eventually, you will have a day when the restraint cracks and you will let your heart come through, and we can already all see what you're thinking about. Seriously, if you are thinking about it and you are constantly angry, you're not fooling anyone. No one at your workplace is like, they were mad all the time? I'm shocked by that. They seem so happy and chipper. We know what's going on in the heart. And Jesus is saying, hey, the Pharisees make sure their outward behavior looks fine and say, look, I didn't actually murder Jesus. I'm telling you, you need to go deeper. He's saying, I can see your heart and I know it's a mess right now. Give me that hate. Give me that anger. Give me that rage. And when you fail, know that I am sufficient but I do not want one of my children carrying that anger, that rage in their chest. I want better for you. I want peace for you. And I certainly don't want you to be one week day away from murder. Can you see this morning why Jesus goes straight for the heart? He isn't just concerned with outward appearance. He wants his children to know that what they're carrying inside their chest, they can surrender unto him. And that what's going on on the inside will eventually get out. If you struggle with this, maybe some of you are very peaceful people. God bless you. The the kingdom of God needs you. If you're anything like me, and you're like, my neighbor does that with the dog too, and I, and I like triggered you this morning, know that this is a process You will not just wake up one day and be like, I feel the the joy of Jesus in my heart every single moment of every single day. But as you continually give this over to Christ and say, Lord, I don't want that anger. I don't want that rage to rule me. I want you to rule me. I want your peace to rule me. I want your comfort to rule me. And then when you stumble, actually repent of it, and say, Lord, I don't want that. I know that I failed back there, and I don't want to be that person. Lord, fill me with your peace. Fill me with your joy. Forgive me when I have made those mistakes. That is a prayer the Lord is longing to answer. 
Your heart will always tell on you. It's why Jesus cares about it so much. Lastly for us today, Jesus wants you to live at peace with others. It cannot be overstated how much Jesus thinks living at peace and making peace, even with adversaries, is important. It's why he picks some of the most important things. He says, if you're at the altar making a gift, there's a bit like saying, if Ryan is leading a song and he's standing here and he's in the middle of a chord and he remembers that he has an issue with another brother or sister, he should put down his guitar, he should walk off stage, and he should go and try and make peace in the name of Jesus. And all of us would look at that and be like, it couldn't have waited? Jesus says no. So that's all of our reaction, right? All of us would look at that and be like, you got something to talk about at that staff meeting. That was weird. He shouldn't be doing that. Just know that if you have that reaction, that is literally the counsel of Jesus Christ. He says making peace is that important that you should leave your gift at the altar. You should stop worshiping God in that moment to go and try and make peace with another brother or sister and try and bring reconciliation. Jesus would rather have you leave in the middle of worship. So that's my counsel to you today, and that's the point of application. Make peace with those who you can. Now, I want to be crystal clear. I understand that some of you, the only way you can live at peace with other people in your life and family in your life is literally having nothing to do with them. That can be peace, amen? Like, like some of you cannot talk to people in your family. Some of you, if you tried to make peace with them, it would literally put you in physical danger. This is not me telling you, go out into the parking lot and go to the person that is toxic and dangerous and that you had to set up clear and healthy boundaries with and try and make peace. Peace can be you not hating them and giving that over to Christ. Peace can be no relationship. In fact, you can't be at war if you don't have a relationship, and peace might be you just letting that go in your heart and giving it over to the Lord. So please don't mishear me today. I'm not telling you to run after toxic mess and let craziness in your life because you're like, Craig said Ryan had to leave worship. I better call this. There are probably people in some of your lives that you have had to escort out of your life for good and biblical reasons but there's probably that guy that you're a jerk to at the office that you probably need to make peace with. You probably just need to scoop up the poop in the name of Jesus and love your neighbor. (laughs) That's not in the notes. That was just me like, it's not that big of a deal. And I do like the dog. I'm sorry, you guys all have a pastor. Like, I process through this stuff at the same time you do. I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm trying to figure it out as you are. But Jesus is saying, make that kind of peace with people. Strive for that kind of peace. To live at peace with your neighbor when you can. To let go the little things when you can. To ignore the, the superficial things when you can. And make peace in the name of Jesus so that you can love them in the name of Jesus. And so you don't carry that around in your heart in the name of Jesus. When our heart is raging against others and holds grudges, Jesus says, that is not my way. I want you to live in my kingdom. And even if your outward behavior hasn't slipped up yet, Jesus is calling all of us to live from the inside out. He says, I want you to have a right heart that produces right behavior because in the heart, that is the real you and I want it to be ruled by my love and my peace. Church, this is the call from Christ today, and it isn't easy, especially if you have a bit of anger in this room. But if you call on Jesus to leave that behind, if you give it over to him minute by minute, day by day, year by year, frankly, you will see the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, which can change you from the inside out. Jesus says, in my kingdom, we're going to focus on the heart, because when just the behavior is shaped like Jesus, a wicked heart will eventually rebel. When the heart is shaped like Jesus, the behavior will fall in line. He says the Pharisees and the teachers that want to be right on the outside, they've succeeded in not murdering someone. But for those in the kingdom of God, we will go beyond that. We will let go of that hate that so easily entangles. We will make peace with those we can. So my question to you this week is how can you lead with love? Randy, do you want to come? I feel like this is a testimony that would... Brother Randy, um, Randy Christian, he, him and his wife Trish uh, run a ministry in town called Souls here, and he just had a testimony he wanted to share real quick. Why don't you come up right now? Because I want to show you what it looks like to lead with love. 
Because if you allow anger and hate to cloud you, you're not going to do this. So why don't you just come forward and share this real quick. This is just practical, everyday stuff. Randy, why don't you share that word? Just wanted to share a prayer, prayer request as well as a praise report. And uh, just an uh, awesome thing with building a relationship and a bridge with uh, uh, people from India. And my wife has... Uh, been asked to have tea time, not on the golf course, but um, so praise Jesus, and that would be a prayer request for all of you to keep this lady from India in prayer, which can open the door to a lot of people from India, so we're excited about it, and uh, thank the Lord. Amen. I, wanna, I wanted you to see that because I want you to have those same kind of moments in your life if you are ruled by anger and hate, you're not going to be thinking about how to reach people. If your heart is ruled by peace and love in Christ, you'll be concerned about your neighbors, and your neighbors might be from India, and might be from Mercer County, but you will be intrigued of how to reach them in the name of Jesus. So we bring that before. That's just an everyday example. If you don't have something like that in there, Start poking around in your heart and saying, is it that the Lord doesn't want me to reach people or have I not made space for that? Let's pray as the worship team comes forward for one final song. God, thank you for this day. I pray that our heart will be made like you, Jesus. Help us to love you better and then help us to live that out better. And God, for each of us that struggle each and every day, God, help us to turn it over to you, to trust you with it, and to walk in newness in the name of Christ. We pray all things. Amen.